Hello, I'm Angus Scott and welcome to this podcast. Today we're discussing the public campaign to release three Al Jazeera journalists from Cairo in Egypt. Arrested and then put in prison in December 2013 and only released after 400 days in prison. Charged a trumped-up charge of aiding terrorists belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood and making false news. So during this podcast, we will understand and uncover the political unrest between Qatar and Egypt during the time of the men's arrest and subsequent incarceration, what it meant for journalism and how the journalism world reacted and clubbed together to put uh, emphasis and attention onto the Egyptian authorities. And we'll also discuss the implications now that Peter Greste has been released and that his two colleagues are still in, uh, in Egypt standing trial. But I think what's important is, if we're going to discuss this, we have to see the timeline of escalation uh, between when um, the new regime took over in Egypt and the time that the three men were arrested. Because since that military coup in 2013, the July of that year, Al Jazeera staff had said that they had been subjected to systematic attacks, intimidation, arrests and confiscation of property. So you go back to June the 28th in 2013 when one of the cameramen, Mohammed Farhat, was hospitalized for two weeks after being beaten by pro-regime Baltagia gangs. Then in July, Egyptian authorities raid offices of Al Jazeera's Mubasha Misa Arabic language channel and 28 employees are arrested. I mean, all the staff were released after six hours, uh, with the exception of the executive Ayman Gabala, who was held for a subsequent four days and then released on bail. So the tensions start rising. You go to July the 12th and five Al Jazeera crew members are detained in Suez while reporting protests there. Move on to August. And correspondent for the Al Jazeera English Channel, this is where the Egyptian service has moved on from the Arabic service onto the English service. And Wayne Hay, the English Channel uh, correspondent, cameraman Adil Bradlow, producers Russ Finn and Baha Mohammed, they are detained in Cairo. Baha is released after a couple of days and the others are deported to Britain after five days in custody. Then in August, the Al Jazeera English cameraman, Mahdi Fatou, and his driver are detained for a few hours and have their equipment confiscated while covering demonstrations. And then on August the 29th in 2013, the executive producer, Shihab El Danin Sharawi, is detained for two days. The account manager, Mustafa Khawa, is detained in Cairo for a day on September the 1st. And then the climax, as it were, of the whole scenario, the three Al Jazeera journalists arrested. Correspondent Peter Greste, the Australian, producers Mohammed Fahmi and Baha Mohammed, and cameraman Mohammed Fawzi. They are all arrested, and they occur during a National Security Service raid on their makeshift bureau in a Cairo Hotel. It's very common for crews like this to have temporary accommodation and to set up in hotels, which is exactly what the Al Jazeera crew had done. And there in that Cairo hotel, their equipment was confiscated. Now, as the London-based Guardian reported at the time, as employees of the Al Jazeera network, which is Qatari-owned, it is a state-sponsored network, Al Jazeera purely owned by the Qatari government, and therein lies a difficulty. And therein lies the reason, much of the reason for my podcast, bearing in mind that I am studying at the moment to see whether there is any editorial independence from Al Jazeera or whether it is ultimately a puppet for the regime. So as employees of the Al Jazeera network, which is Qatari owned, as we were saying, the trio were subsequently accused and convicted of belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood, a banned Islamist group and supported by Qatar. 
Now, other newspapers and campaign organizations were quick to suggest that the Qatar links to Al Jazeera clearly had an overriding factor in the men's arrests. Even the Christian Science Monitor stated at the journalist's trial that it was the politicized trial intended, intended to punish Egypt's arch-rival Qatar, which owns the Al Jazeera network. And Qatar is a staunch supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood, it went on, and has offered sanctuary to parts of its senior leadership as they escape Egypt, where the group has been blacklisted as a terrorist organization. Even the English Daily Telegraph uh, added its weight to that line of argument, saying Grester and his colleagues were arrested at the height of a diplomatic row between Egypt and Qatar, which owns Al Jazeera. The broadcaster had criticised the deadly crackdown on Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood movement following the Islamic leader's overthrow. Now, subsequently, Qatar has since moved to repair its ties with Egypt and Al Jazeera has closed its Arabic-language Egyptian affiliate, which backed the Brotherhood. So I think what is plain to see here is this was much more than just some journalists doing something wrong, even if they weren't doing anything wrong and just doing their job. This was uh, all played out under a shadow of a huge political cloud that was over the bilateral relations between Egypt and Qatar. Qatar, it was seen and is stated by The Guardian that they have acted as a cheerleader for the uprisings of the Arab Spring. And remember when these started in the north of Africa, um, that Qatar backed them then. So they have acted as cheerleader for the uprisings of the Arab Spring, while the other Gulf states have fretted about their own stability at a time of much, much regional change. So, according to Emil Hokayem, an analyst with the International Institute of Strategic Studies, the Saudis and the Emiratis, they see the Muslim Brotherhood as fundamentally a transnational movement. So Qatar's relationship with the Brotherhood is seen as facilitating a Trojan horse. So not only was there huge concern within Egypt of Qatar's support of the Muslim Brotherhood, but also within the Gulf states as a whole, those GCC states, the Gulf Cooperation Council states, which made, are made up of the likes of Saudi Arabia, uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, and others who were particularly concerned at the way Qatar was running its business. The other problem with Qatar and Al Jazeera was not only was Qatar seen as a, an outspoken supporter of Mohamed Morsi, who was the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, who was overthrown after those democratic uh, elections. He was overthrown in 2013. It was also seen as a backer of the rebels fighting to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad of Syria. So in December, as we know, the three journalists were sent to prison on these trumped-up charges. Nine months later, it is interesting to note that when we talk about the political interest of this story, that Qatar pledged to expel exiled leaders of Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood as one of the conditions of an agreement forced on the wealthy Gulf state by Saudi Arabia, the UAE and other neighbours, the GCC. And also, interestingly, it was reported in The Guardian again, which followed this case with uh, huge interest, such is the nature uh, of The Guardian, that it also stated that Qatar also agreed to stop attacking Egypt in Al Jazeera broadcasts. Now, if this were proved to be the case, this would be a huge pointer to the fact that the state-run broadcaster was indeed inflicting influence, editorial influence, on Al Jazeera as a whole and its broadcasts. Now this would have a huge bearing on my subsequent research, should this be proven to be the case. What I think is interesting to note at the time, and from Egypt's point of view, is the fact that 
the three men that they arrested and charged and put on trial and ultimately found guilty. And remember, they were sentenced to seven years in jail on this uh, trumped-up charge. And uh, Bahia Muhammad was given an additional three years because police who searched his home found a spent bullet casing he'd picked up at a protest. So what is interesting from the arrest of these three is that they were all associated with Al Jazeera English. And that the lead of that team, Peter Greste, the journalist, was an Australian. And by arresting and incarcerating him, along with his two colleagues, there was bound to be more publicity. What they perhaps couldn't have guaranteed was the publicity that Gresty and his uh, colleagues got from other journalistic neighbours. And in by that, I mean that not only did the BBC, CNN, who was a direct um, competitor to Al Jazeera in the region, but also ITV in England and many other networks, most notably in Australia as well, all supported the release of these men. And what started then was a very interesting and huge uh, social media campaign, and never has the hashtag been more keenly used. The hashtag free AJ staff was used throughout the world. Even CNN um, anchor Christiane Amanpour raising her own card on air with the hashtag free AJ staff. And pictures of members of the Al Jazeera team in Doha in their newsroom holding up placards, hashtag free AJ staff, and with their mouths sealed by tape. Very powerful images that showed a lack of ability to express themselves within Egypt. As I said, the support came from some unlikely places. And the BBC was behind the journalists as well. Just look at the nature of this report by Orla Girin. And the way there's a slightly ghostly, threatening theme to the start of uh, her piece. A grainy video with a sinister soundtrack. This footage shows the raid on Al Jazeera's hotel room in late December. It's been broadcast on national TV. There's a glimpse of Peter Gresta. Then the interrogation begins. His producer, Mohammed Fatmi, trying to explain they were just doing their jobs. But with their colleague, Beher Mohammed, in the centre, they've been branded the Marriott terror cell and accused of aiding the now-banned Muslim Brotherhood. Al Jazeera is owned by the government of Qatar, which backs the Brotherhood, but the channel denies allegations of bias. Egypt says its journalists broke the law by working without press passes. It is fairly reported, but wherever you look in these stories, not only in The Guardian in England, the BBC, the Christian Science Monitor, the Times of Israel, wherever you look, the association with Al Jazeera is that it is Qatari owned and owned by the government. How can it ever escape from that moniker of being a state sponsored and a state subsidized network. That in itself is not a bad thing, but clearly the implication is pejorative here. And that the role of this public service broadcaster is actually to be the voice of Qatar and not the voice of free speech. The difficulty here though remains the difference between Al Jazeera English and the Arabic sister service. Any analysis needs to be separate for both channels, and the difficulty is obviously not being a na native uh, Arabic speaker, then my concentration is on the English language version.
But I wanted to end by one damning piece that came out of the Globe and Mail, the Toronto-based Canadian newspaper. And the interview given by Mohamed Fahmi, the Canadian-Egyptian journalist who was uh, arrested and incarcerated with Peter Gresti and Baha Mohammed. And in it, he says, I know how the grapevine works in Al Jazeera and that the managers who defend the actions of the channel are only parroting the instructions filtered down from its Qatari chairman, who happens to be from the royal family. It is Qatar's business if they ought to sue Egypt, but not when I am stuck in a cage in such a politicised case. Al Jazeera will defend its editorial integrity to the hilt. And I, as a journalist within the organisation, as I said before, have never seen the hand of anyone from above trying to impose a directive on our editorial balance. But that may be for you to decide. Thanks for listening. We'll be back again next week.